You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. People give information to the police to revenge on other villains, financial reward for themselves, to get rid of the opposition, to clear the field for them. I've done jobs around heroin, ecstasy, guns, lorry hijackings, contract killings. There's a conspiracy already in me and you can join that. And it's all, not for your own back, senior management make decisions and look at everything and they put you in there. There's, I can't talk about some, right? Yeah, yeah. Because um, I wasn't disclosed. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that would uh, like to square, square the books, balance the books. Um, so a lot of them I, I can't talk about. And I wouldn't, that, that's for my own safety. personal safety and reasons. Boom, we're on. Boom, we're away. <laughs> <laughs> and today's guest, we've got Undercover Cop Don, we believe your name is for today. You've released a book called Undercover Legends, which we'll touch on. We've had to pixelate your face for safety reasons, of course, because you brought down some of the biggest crime families in the UK. So it's for your own protection. First and foremost, how are you, Don? I'm very well, thank you. Had a nice walk across London to get here today. Blistering hot, but yeah, good. How are you feeling about sitting across the other end of the table today, getting questioned? Well, from a legend like you. <laughs> <laughs> I probably know what it feels for the others. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm quite, I'm looking forward to it, fella. I really am, yeah. Good. Well, three books here today. We've got Undercover Legends, yeah. which your, is your book. Yeah. But it's connected to Operation George and Undercover, Undercover by Stephen Bentley. Right. Why is these three books connected? Okay. right. The conduit through there is Stephen Bentley. Um, Bentley wrote his book on Operation Julie, which was a big LSD job back in the, the late 70s, where an undercover police and didn't have any rules. You could do the gear, you could get pissed, you just phoned in your report at the end of the day. And when you get to Undercover Legends, you'll see the changes in that. So I I um, listened to Bentley's podcast, and the next thing I see Bentley's name come out on is Operation George with a guy called Mark Dickens. And I thought, well, if he's helping Dickens write books, he might help me write one. So I reached out to, to Bentley, and a great guy, um, lives out in the Philippines. I've never met the boat. We've done everything th over the, um, the internet. And we put all, um, Undercover Legends together. And we're working on a further book from that called Operation Candle, which I'm sure as this interview progresses, the... Um, the characters in Operation Candle all sort of come together in the book on uh, in Undercover Legends. Yeah. The Operation George one looks fascinating with Mark Dickens and Stephen Bentley. I believe you know them, so it'll be good to get them on at some point to maybe tell their story about this book. Can you give a, a brief well uh, talk on this book? Um, well, as I say, um, Bentley's out in the Philippines. Mark Dickens I know through a third party. Um, and that's how I got in touch with him. Whether he'd come on your show and talk about that, I don't know. It's about a um, terrorist, a loyal, uh, loyalist terrorist in Northern Ireland who was suspected of murdering a prominent solicitor, Rosemary Nelson. Um, he fled to America. They got him back from America. He walked into what I would describe, and I think it says in the book, the Truman Show. He's... Um, encapsulated by undercover police officers who do scams with him. He thinks he's involved in a big gang of uh, criminals. And whilst he's with them, he's telling them all about his deeds that he did in, um, across the water during the Troubles. And the second half of the book is all about the court trials and how there was a struggle to get some of the evidence in, how some of it got thrown out and how some of it stood. Good book, good read. Yeah. So let's go on to your story. That... I always go back to the start for my guests, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, like you, Jimmy, I was born in Scotland. Were you a Scotsman? I'm a Scotsman, yeah. Um, and I'm one of five kids. 
when we moved to, my dad moved down to Manchester, that's what I told him, what I do do. Um, I was about five at the time and he came down for work and at that time there was three of us um, under the age of six maybe, yeah. Um, he got a job with a railway working on their road fleet and then we lived in a railway house, so it was like a Coronation Street house, one door, one window, one door, one window, all the way up the street. And then the fourth kid come along, my younger sister. Um, so there was six of us and a dog living in a two-bedroom terrace house with a railway goods yard behind us. We didn't have anything, we didn't have much money, we didn't have much of anything. And then we got a council house with an inside toilet and a bathroom and three bedrooms. And uh, me and my brother shared a bedroom, shared a bed. My clothes came from my cousins, who were taller than me and had bigger feet than me. In fact, do you remember the old winkle picker shoes? The little points on the yeah, toes, right? Yeah, the shit flickers. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got a pair of them passed down to me from one of my cousins. But I used to walk out of them because they're too big. And the school I went to had stone steps, and I used to sound like a lame donkey going up these steps, it's clipping the clock. So we packed the toes with a newspaper. But as the, the shoes wore and they got wet, the toes curled up like little Aladdin slippers like that and I had the piss taken on me relentlessly at school for that. So I used to get all my second-hand clothes, shared a bed. We didn't have any money. The gas was on a meter, um, the gas was on a meter, the electric was on a meter, the telly was on a meter. I remember a bailiff coming once to take the telly away because, you know, you had to pay some bill or something some day. And um, they went to take the telly and my dad said, oh, you can have it, but in that was his Granadas. And they went away with an iron that didn't even work, you know, like an electric iron that didn't work. And so all that went on. Um, I used to take myself off to the doctors when I was nine with ailments. Um, if social services were what they were today, we wouldn't have stayed at home as, as kids. Um, went to school, didn't do too well at school. I mean, they call it, when we say gangs, it's not like the gangs of today that you hear about running around with knives and stabbing people. You know, we had gangs, gangs of lads, you know, and you would have a row with the gang from the other street. But, you know, it'd be a row, a chase, a kick, a punch, and everybody runs away. Uh, so I grew up in that. Um, a lot of my mates got in trouble with the law. I used to run with them, and I was lucky that I never sort of took a fall like some of them did. Um, Mum was a bingo nut. My dad used to go to the pub. If the electric went, we used to have to go and knock a door and borrow a shilling to put in there while, before they, you know, till they got home. Um, so we had, you know, it was poor, but everyone was the same. You didn't, you didn't realise, you didn't know uh, what the difference was. And then at 16, I used to do a milk round and a paper round and I used to make money. Like, and I was probably, and I, and I wasn't daft with my money. I'd, you know, I'd save it or I'd buy something I wanted with it. And, um, uh, I was a real street smart kid. And then I joined the army in 16. Like a lot of these people that I've seen on your podcast, they have crap beginnings and then they go into the military in some way or other. And that, I was a street smart kid when I went in there. I played good football. So the, if you're good at sport in the army, it, it helps. Um, and I got my own bed. I got three square meals a day. I got clothes that nobody had ever worn. I had somebody telling me what to do, disciplining me, you know, what the military's like. And um, I loved it. And I quickly went up the ranks in the army and I got educated, I got book smart. So I went in street smart and I got book smart. And those two things coming together when I went to join the corps were a great combination, great combination. How long were you in the army for? 13 years, 169 days. <laughs> yeah. Time, on it? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Where did you go? Um, mostly was in Germany in those days, um, BAOR, um, waiting for the Russians to come. Um, I was first posted to um, Bulford in uh, Salisbury Plain. From there, I went to Cyprus and to Kenya, and then back to Bulford. And then from there, I went to Germany for the first time, posted to Germany for the first time. Um, then once then I got posted back to the UK, back to our training regiment. So this kid that had no education when he got school is now training recruits for the army. 
And that's where that books and art thing came in. Because you can't get promotion in the military unless you do exams. You've got to do education. If you don't do education, you won't get promoted. What was Kenya like? Hot. What was <laughs> that? Bit, yeah, I was out there in... Um, Why Kenya? Why was Andy there? A, right, there's, there's a big military training area in Kenya, and it should have been... It's generally an infantry battalion that goes, but they got sent on an emergency tour of Northern Ireland. So they looked around the garrison and they sent my lot. So it's, um, you got to do stuff that you wouldn't normally do on exercise. We'd go on exercise, we'd communicate, that's what we did. Um, but because this was a, uh, an infantry exercise area, we got to do everything. Grenades, 66, 81 millimeters, GPMGs. And it was a flag waving exercise as well, because they used to get incursions coming across. I can't remember from where. Because it was curfews and we couldn't stay down if we, when we had some downtime in Nairobi. We had to be back. We had to be back in the... Um, we stayed in railway sheds that were behind the Kenyan army camp. And one of the flights... Do you want to hear this? I mean, it's no, a, no, I want to hear that. So um, one of the squadrons that was due out before us, their flight got cancelled. So they asked my squadron, the whole squadron, any volunteers so we can you know, get these lads out quicker. So me and my three mates, and we were like four musketeers. We, we, we used, to go, used to go to some antics. We said, we'll stay behind. He said, it's no fatigues, no guards. It's your own time. You just got to be in for the curfew. So um, we volunteered to stay behind. And we went and hired a car from the local hotel on like a, a moody blank Lloyd Bank check or something like that. I don't know. And um, so we had this car hired. I didn't have a driving license at the time. I think it's beyond the statute of the um, statute books now. I can't get done for this. And it was in Kenya anyway. So I didn't have a driving license. Well, my three mates did, but I was paying for the car as well. I was paying my corner of the car. So I wanted to drive it. So what we used to do was we'd go out during the day, come back, park the car outside on the road, bimble through the Kenyan army camp to the railway shed to the back. Um, then we'd get out under the fence, along the railway lines, back out to the car, then go back into Nairobi and do the nightclubs and places for repute and places like that. And uh, we'd come back, park the car up, back through the Kenyan army camp, we'd have to climb the fence uh, or go under the fence. And then one night we come out of a nightclub and I went, they said, you can drive. Well, we're all, you know, we've all had a drink. So I think, oh, I can't drive. So I pull into a lot of things, a car park, and I've only pulled into an open air church, and it's right opposite the Kenyan secret place. Fast asleep, and all of a sudden you get this knock on the window. And these two are like long blue trench coats that cops out there and carry big bands. And I look out the corner of my eye and I see this blue trench coat and I see the band. And fuck. So we get out of the car and you know, he's forgive my Kenyan English accents. He's going, um, what you doing here? What you doing here? And I said, I just parked up. I said, I didn't know where it was. I just parked up. He said, this church, this church, and that Kenyan secret police. I said, oh, fuck, I'm so, so fucking sorry. I said, well, I'll get in the car and I'll drive away. No, 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 no. Jail tonight, go tomorrow. I thought, oh, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> let's fucking put the brakes on this. I said, to get in the car and let's just go. He said, no, jail tonight, go tomorrow. And we had the about five minutes or two in a throwing with this jail tonight, go tomorrow, jail tonight, go tomorrow. And I said, all right, fuck it, take us to jail. My mates, they're awake, but they're not getting out of the car. I said, all right, fuck it, take us to jail. And he goes, no, 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 Tommy, Tommy, Tommy. Maybe we compromise. I said, I'm fucking not having any of this. So I go to my mate, I said, yeah, come here. No, <laughs> witnesses. I said, compromise, mate, what do you mean by compromise? He said, you give me money, Johnny, you give me money. Well, there's 17 Kenyan shillings to the pound there. So how much do you want? He said, 500 shillings, 500. Fuck off, take us to jail. He said, 20 shillings, 20 shillings, Johnny, 20 shillings. So uh, we gave him 20 shillings. He gave us a bit of paper with a number written on and we drove off. 500 to 20. I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah good negotiator. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I spent some time in Kenya. Had a great time out there. Um, Germany. I used to get pissed off in Germany because it was always exercise, exercise, exercise. We were always out there painting wagons, cleaning wagons. And uh, I was a senior in CO then. Uh, almost on one of my chores out there. And, you know, I didn't even want to tell them to clean the fucking wagons because I knew how soul-destroying it was. So um, 
when I was, uh, I got posted back to the UK, as I was saying, training. And in 1982, the RGs invaded the Falklands and I was in Catterick. And they have a thing in the military called rulement, which means um, certain regiments have responsibilities for supplying personnel with certain skill sets. And I used to do the cryptographic stuff, the coding and all that. And this regiment in Germany was given the responsibility of providing the senior NCO with that skill set to the, to the Falklands. And it was a rugby regiment and I was a footballer, so that didn't go down well. And um, I got sent there and I was between marriages at the time. So they said, right, we're going to hang on to you. We sent you down over Christmas because you're, you're not married. I had kids, but because you're not, you're not married, we'll send you over Christmas. Um, so that's what happened. I, um, I, I went down there um, about a year after the war, it must have been, because I, I went, I was in, down there over Christmas and New Year, 83 into 84. Um, and whilst I was there, I bumped into an old mate of mine who was now uh, to see the squadron. He like, come off through the ranks, got commissioned. I won't, I won't, I won't put his name out there. Uh, because I know his son really well as well now. So um, when I was there, I call him Bill Wright, because it helps with the story, Bill. So I walk into the squadron, it was in the old Sibby Hospital in Stanley. Stanley was still a mess, and Mount Pleasant, which is now an airport, was a mountain, and you couldn't fly passenger jets into the Falklands then. You could take an Hercules, but you couldn't take a VC-10 or a TriStar or whatever they were using. So you used to fly to the, the, uh, fly to the Ascension Island, and then helicopter onto uh, a ship, and I went down on the Uganda, which had been the hospital ship during the war. And because of senior NCO, I got my own cabin. That was quite nice. And uh, there's two two pools on the Uganda. One at the front, which was for officers and senior NCO. One at the back was for the lads. <laughs> and well, <laughs> I think they must have only had to put a cup of water in the pool because once they all got in there, it's almost like the ship was going through the water like that with its the bow up in the air. Uh, so yeah, then it was two weeks then. That brought air travel and sea travel home to me. Because the ascension is virtually halfway. So we took 12 hours in a plane to get from Bryce North to the ascension. And we stopped at Dakar to get some petrol. And then the same distance on a ship was two weeks. And um, Uganda was too big to go into Port Stanley. I had to go on anchor at um, Port William, I think it's called. But you could see through the Navy Point and where, where is it Navy Point? Yeah, I think so. Oh, and, and Stanley Airport, you could see through there. You see all these little wriggly tinned, different, like candlelit green houses and the smell of pea burning. That's uh, that's uh, my first memories of getting down there. Anyway, I, spoke, I get in there and I meet, I meet Bill, we call him Bill Rock, and he's an officer now, Bill. He's a captain. And I go, all right, Bill. He goes, it's not, it's not Bill anymore, Don. It's um, Captain William. I said, no, no. I said, I'm not even saluting you. I'm not even saluting you, Bill. And uh, it was great because he, he was an ally. And uh, not that I needed one at that time. Oh, I didn't realise I needed one. But he, he had a skill, Bill. He had a skill. He'd, uh, you used to shit yourself when you were on the receiving end of this. Right? He'd say, he always had a gap in his teeth. always had a fag between it. People, people that listen to this, they know, they know exactly what I'm talking about. He goes, I've been looking around this squadron, Don, and there's only one bloke I can trust to pull this off. And you think, oh, fucking hell, no, 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 Bill, please don't. Come here. And um, wait, wait, he got me. He could organise committees for committees for committees. That's how Bill worked. He had a committee looking at committee. He, he's like... Um, Captain Paper, mate, he could, he, he's, he's horrendous. He, had, he talk about control. He wanted everything. He wanted to control everything. He had all these groups doing everything. So he said, um, want to start a tombola off on the island? And he said, you ought to talk for it. Because I used to get all around the island because my lads were on top of all the, the mountains providing the communications. So I used to have easy access to a helicopter if I needed one. And... Um, I had new people here and I knew people there. I was quite a networker. So he got me organising this bingo stuff. 
and we were selling. There was nothing else to do down there, right? And we were selling like bingo tickets for fun. And I can't remember the figures. Now, let's say that we sold 500 pounds worth of tickets a week and would give 250 quid or 300 quid out in prizes. And the other 200 quid would go into the squadron funds, legit, you know, we're in a, we're in a moody thing. And uh, so we're doing this, it was really popular. And I was getting on the local radio station because I knew them in there. And I was getting celebrities in to come and pull the numbers out. And I say celebrities, just well-known people around the island or something like that, the vicar or the DJ off the radio or something. And uh, yeah, it was going really well. And then Bill calls me in one day. He said, Don, Don, come here, have a look at these. And they look like a set of accounts. I said, what are they, what are they, Bill? He said, we're getting audited. What do you think these are like? I said, fucking, <laughs> you're joking. Because <laughs> the army just shit out on that sort of stuff. I mean, he was all legit, but he'd be behind on his paperwork, I guess. So, yeah, we were doing that. But in return, um, I saw a job being advertised, an instructor's job, not with my lot, with another lot. And it was, you only had one, one of my sort of people there. And I said to, I said to Bill, in payment for what I done for you, I'd like to get that job. Well, technically it's not, he would have to ask my firm back in Germany. And um, so me and Bill contacted our man in records and got it all in motion, but we only informed my unit back in Germany. We didn't make them actionable on it. Just only for your information, this is what's going on basically. So um, I got the job. I got the job whilst I was in the Falklands and the start date. And, um, I got back to Germany and I was a senior NCO by then. And my boss calls me in and I think it's just a little pat on the back, rub your tummy, what a great job you did down there, well done. And he just sort of looked at me like that across the desk. He said, you've got something to tell me. I was always a bit, you know. Larry? <laughs> not Larry, no, yeah. not Larry, just. You know, I knew where he was, he was getting at, and I go, mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and he fucking ripped me apart because he said I'd gone behind his back, but there's nothing he could do about it. And the regiment was going on a training camp on some big ranges down in Germany. So, like, the whole regiment would go through it one week or two weeks at a time, each squadron. And he was firing machine guns, firing rifles, firing, throwing grenades doing 66 anti-tank and um, 81 millimeter anti-tank, doing all this sort of stuff. So he said, right, I'm going to send you down there for six weeks. So in the last six weeks, I was down there throwing in grenades for, for a laugh. How, when was the jump from the army to the undercovers, the, the cops? Well, the, that area I told you I grew up in, the cops were on our street every day, right? They were either nicking somebody, going through somebody's door, somebody just got out of strange ways, somebody just going there, going to visit someone. Yeah, it was that sort of environment. It was always, the police were there and Strange Ways was always there. And I don't know what, I think with hindsight now, with age, I look back and I think there's something got into my DNA there about being a cop, right? Um, was it ever in your mind before you went to the army? No, not at all. No, it, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have crossed. Since when I became a cop, a lot of the guys I grew up with, they weren't horrible about it. They said, well, I said, no, you know, you come to the other side and you wouldn't have a drink with me in the pub. I don't miss that. I really don't miss it. Because um, some of those guys are sat on the same bar stool their dad sat on 50 years ago, looking like the dad. Um, and they all look 20 years older than me now. So somewhere in my DNA was this, I want to be a, it, it was this bug, this uh, something inside me that I wanted to be a cop. Um, and when I got this job, at this um, training school in the UK. Um, I, I said I was there for 13 years, 169 days. Um, the first 18 months that didn't count because I was only 16. And you know, your pension doesn't start until year 18 or something. I was 16 and a half when I went in. So um, when I was in this instructor job in the UK, my 12 year point was coming up. And that's when you get, you, you, know, you get a bit of a pension. So I applied to join one of the UK police forces from um, nearby where I was um, stationed. 
and I had to give the army 18 months notice to quit. So I went through this process to be a cop through the interviews and the exams. Like I say, when I left school, street smart, no book smart. I never read a book till I was about 30. And then I got book smart in the army. And I passed the entrance exam for the police and the interviews for the police. I wouldn't have been able to do it at 16, 17 years of age. I wouldn't be able to do it. Um, and I got accepted. And then I told them they'd have to wait 18 months whilst I put my ticket in. And they were fine with that. So um, that was it. So at the age of 30, I left the army with 12 years pensionable service, which I transferred into the police pension service, which meant I only had to do 20 years. Because in those days you retired with a 30 year pension after 30 years. So my 12 years bought me just under 10 years police pension. Um, so I got into the cops. So something in my DNA from when I was a kid, and this will sound pretty corny as well. Is, but remember that program, the bill? Yeah. There was a DI on there, a Galloway or something like that. And, you know, he was a, a go get sort of guy. And I thought, I want to work for somebody like that. I want to be, going to be a cop and I'm going to work for somebody like that. I only wanted to be on CID. Didn't want to do anything. People used to say to me, um, why don't you go on the firearms? You know, because I was a, f a weapons instructor. I could teach everything from a nine millimeter pistol or to a anti-tank and um, grenades and claymore mine. I could teach all that sort of stuff. And they said, why don't you go in the firearms? You know, you're fucking ideal. You cut out for it. You know why? I didn't want to go because I fucking hate cleaning guns. I fucking hate it. How long does it take to clean a gun? <laughs> well, if you're the instructor in charge of the recruit tree cleaning a gun, it'll take him all afternoon because you'll make sure he gets every bit of shitty carbon off there. It is, you know, it, it doesn't take long. It, it's, it's a laborious job. And you're back in those days, I mean, they probably got some magic fluid to dip it all into now. It takes the carbon off if you have to do that. But you used to, you used to scrape it off and use a tool to do this and a tool to do that. And your gun oil, as long as you've got gun oil on your clothes, you smell of gun oil all day. So I just hate you cleaning. What's the most powerful gun you've shot? Oh, I've, um, I've, when I went undercover, I used to go on courses to, on firearms courses, familiarisation and firing them. Um, so, I mean, I've fired five Magnums, I've fired sawn of shotguns, I've fired GPMGs, I fired um, the 66 millimeter anti tank, the 81 millimeter anti tank. So I've fired some heavy shit, yeah. I've never fired at anybody in anger, though, that's it. So you say. <laughs> What's it like throwing grenades? Oh. I've got, like, when you're a kid, man, you used to have the little plastic grenades and you used to have your little army figures. And it was always a fascination for a man to have guns or grenades. Like, what was that feeling to then throw one? Right, when, when I first started doing them, do you remember the, like the World War II grenades you see? It looks like a pan. Yeah, you pull the little clips. The, so but, yeah, the big thing. Yeah, 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 like yeah. You pull it and you, you hold the grenade down. It's got what's called a fly-off lever, right? Which stops the, the fuse uh, igniting. And it, as soon as you throw that, that fly-off lever comes off. It ignites the fuse. And then it's on a three, four, five-second delay, whatever it is. And then the fuse ignites the explosives within the grenade. So you have these big fuck off chunky things from World War II. When I finished, you know, someone will put me right on that. I think they called the L2, and it was a smooth, um, same shape as a hand grenade, but it was smooth metal casing, fly off lever, same principle. But inside, you had like coiled wire that was you know, like chipped and in, nipped into little bits, and that. When that exploded, the fragments would fucking go everywhere. So, um, what's it like throwing them? It's all right when you're throwing. It's when some recruits throwing them, and you, you know, and he panics. Or I've, I've never had one go off in the, the throwing bay because you have these bays and they're like trenches, like the World War One trenches, right? And you teach them to pull the pin out. They look that they've got the pin there. Then they look at the grenade and then they throw it and shout grenade. Well, I've seen some of them, you know, that have landed really short and you have to pull the recruit back out. I've heard some where the fucking grenades landed in the, the trench with them and, and it's all like walls. So, you, you know, people have had to drag them behind different walls. But yeah. Uh, is it, see, when you pull that clip and, pin, and, and, and you pin. unlace, is there any that ever just exploded without the three, four seconds? No. Because you're putting trust into somebody who obviously makes those. Right, but there yeah. could be a couple of duds, like anything in life. 
is right. They're, they're the grenades that kill people, right? Those there that we're talking about. Now you know they use flashbang grenades as well. Have you heard of them? No. Okay, it's like what special forces use when they open the room and they throw them in, and they instantly go bang, 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 and it disorientates everybody in there, it fills the room full of smoke. Their ear drums are fucked, right? And they're called flashbangs because that's what they do. Bang. So on one of the courses I was on, um, we were uh, working with some special forces and they had some flashbangs down there with us. So um, I thought, well, I'd like, you know, I'd like to have a go at that. So there was this opportunity to, you know, throw one of these flashbangs. Now you've got to remember, for 13 years, 169 days, I was taught to throw a grenade like that. You know, like a cricket ball, throw it in the air and lob it. So uh, I get this flashbang and the instructor, special force instructor, been in Afghan, been on the wrong end of, you know, a firefight, uh, been in wars. You know, he's he done what I'd never done. He, he, he's actually done it. So he, he gives me this grenade and I pull the pin out like that. And I throw it like a proper hand grenade. I toss it in the air like that. And you don't do that with flashbangs. You have to throw them straight in because they go off. <laughs> well, this thing fucking air burst. Right? Am, what? But went off in the air and a bit of the casing went down the, the neck of this special forces guy between his smock and his neck and burning him up. And he says something about, I've been to Afghan, I've been to Iraq, I've served in Northern Ireland. Not a fucking scratch. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to He's got second degree burn color. on him. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it's like throwing up. That's the only time I've ever injured anybody yeah. with a, a weapon of war. What about landmines? Like, uh, no, we never never touched them. Um, clay, a claymore, which you would put out on a patrol base. See, if you stand on them, are you, are you fucked up? Because I've seen people, now it's in films, but they've tried, when they've been standing on them, people have... But not defuse them, but they've managed to get a clip back and no, where they no, can no, take their foot uh, off. No, you know, I, you know, you see these lads in Afghan that are coming back with fucking limbs missing. And, I don't know. You know, there's there's, there's probably there's no thinking time. You but man, it's gone, isn't it? Yeah. So, um, so you've went from the army to then the cops. The cops. Yeah. So you wanted to be CID. How long have you got to be on the beat for to then go to CID? Did you have any special treatment because you'd already served in the army? No, because no, fair, no. It's quite late not to join the cops. No, there's. Um, it's all different nowadays. They, they don't recruit from the military anymore, which I think is a fucking sad thing. Because in a in a military man, you've got someone that's used to wearing uniform, taking orders, working on his initiative, working as a team member. You, you The transferable skills from a soldier to a policeman, phenomenal, right? I, I didn't have no problem whatsoever going through that transformation of being a soldier to being a police officer. Um, I went in at 30 and a lot of servicemen used to join the police. So I was, as a mature recruit, I think that's what they used to call me, a mature recruit. But there was guys older than me that was coming in from the services. Some had done that 22 years and then come into the police. And Is that because they needed some structure about a organisation in life? James, what? to be honest, it's just, it's one of those natural steps. Not everybody wants to take it, but it's a natural step from the forces, from the military into the police. Because you come out of the military do you 22 years you're 40 years of age you know you still got in those days 25 years of work left in you mm -hmm. so you could join the police you get you know the army's giving you a pension and the police are paying you and you're paying into another pension scheme pension schemes are good but they were expensive to buy into the, uh, the contributions were quite i think there's 11 percent of contributions were um so i forgot what your question was an argument about yeah, so when you went to, you wanted to go, oh, yeah. how long were you on the beat for? Yeah, right, that's it. So that state I grew up in, yeah. in Manchester, have you ever watched Shameless? Yeah. Right, it's like that, right? Yeah. That's what my estate was like. It was, you know, and I, I include me in it, it was full of dysfunctional people living dysfunctional lives in a dysfunctional council estate. Um, not, if anybody's, not everybody was, but a lot of us were, right? Nobody had a pot to piss in. Um, when I got through my police training, I don't know, 10, 15 weeks, whatever it was, I got sent and my first beat was a council estate full of first and second rate generation companies. And that's where they put me. Not because of my background, it was just, I was the next name on the list and I went there. Well, mate, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. It, I knew what they were going to do before they even thought of doing it. And so, I became a good thief taker um, 
um, bad cases to the attention of the CID people. The other thing I was good at was discretion. Um, I wouldn't nail people to the cross for any for, for everything, right? I used to use discretion. A good example of that would be if I knew um, matey boy was um, driving with no tax, no insurance, I'm able to say, you know, he's running the kids to school, so I'd stop him. I'd walk his kids to school and say, don't drive your car until you agree it all legal again. I'm sure he'd go back 10 minutes later, once the coast was clear again, he can't take it back to his house. Right? So I didn't persecute everybody for it. If it was serious, if it was people had got harmed or stuff had got damaged and we couldn't sort it out between us, yeah, you, you, you know, he's, he's going to get a nick in, he's going to go court for criminal damage or assault, ABH, GBH, what have you. Um, but if it was just minor stuff, I used to use discretion. And then I found that they would then come to me and say, you know, these shed breaks you're getting, or all these car radios are getting screwed. Low level crime. They told me he was doing it, and they told me where the stuff was. So I'd go and get some warrants and retrieve the stuff and go and nick them. Again, get me to the attention of the CID. And at the same time, I'm fostering relationships with these people. I'm now registering the informants. Now, you know, normally informants are run by CID back in those days. They have special units now, informant handling units. But back then, CID officers used to run informants. I was running my own informants and getting good stuff. I was getting burglars, I was getting drug dealers, street level drug dealing. Um, stuff like that. Sort of bulk crime, you would call it. And um, one day I walked in, I was on a, um, used to get opportunities to go on like what they called a car squad. So you'd be in trainers, jeans and a t-shirt because car crime was like, you know, out through the roof back in those days. And I've got another view on that if you remind me. Uh, so you go on the car squad and I walked in the office one day and one of the lads was going off the team and he had a pile of crime complaints like that. And uh, the sergeant was just dishing them out to everybody. I said, I'll take half a dozen, give me half a dozen, I'll go and have a look at that. And one of them was where a bloke had bought a car on HP, made first payment and fucking disappeared. And then the car has been sold to a supposedly innocent party living in a different part of town. Common sort of practice back in those days. So, um, you know, he's lost the car. And he said, well, I paid good money for you. I paid fucking good money for it. You, you know, you paid well under the market value. So I treated him as a witness to get the statement to go on Nick Mayboy. boy. But I'll tell you, this guy, he was, he was, he was like an eel. Couldn't never, I was always about two weeks behind him wherever he was. He had credit card fraud, mortgage fraud, finance fraud, every sort of fraud you could mention, he had it and he was doing it. And uh, the more I found out about him, the more interesting he was. And he was way above, you know, I should have just given him straight to CID or something. But I kept all of him. And uh, eventually nicked him. And I registered him as an informant. And he was like international level. The stuff he was giving me, counterfeit currency, drug importations, a big drug importation. His wife was Colombian, so he was well connected. And um, I was running him as a, um, as a snout. And I met him at a service station on the motorway. This is like, you know, for a, a junior officer. Yeah, I, I, was, I was punching above my weight, really punching above my weight with it. So I went to meet him and I always took somebody else with me because he was a dangerous, like, slippery fucker. And then uh, we met him at a service station, say six o'clock one evening. And then the next morning, put the contact report in and everything else. What he's, what he's talking about, counterfeit currency. And um, I get a call from the... DS from the RCS office gives me a call up across. So I go in there, there's the DS that stood there and the DI in, the, in their office. And I walk in and I think, what the fuck's this about? And they said, um, did you meet with an informant yesterday? And it was almost confrontational the way we were saying it. I said, I might have done And if I had done, I would have caught a report. In. And he pulled the report out and put it on his desk. I said, no, I did, and that's the report. I said, do I need the Federation? Do I need somebody in with me? He said, no, 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 not at all. He said, you met him at six, we met him at seven. He told you about the counterfeit currency and he told us about this. He said, it doesn't work, both of us, these are the RCS, right? This is where I want to be. 
He said, don't worry, because both remain the same foreman. So you can have it, or we'll take him off you. Which, whichever you want, we're not bothered. Well, I want to be on the RCS, don't I? <sighs> you have it. Lovely. So off he went and, uh, with that. And I never heard anything from him for years and years and years. And then from the informant, then about five, six years later, fucking phone rings on the desk and I pick it up. He goes, hello, Sam, how are you doing? Fuck. I said, how did you find me here? You, know, you worry about that. And it was him. But by which time he'd been registered as a dangerous informant. Um, still had good quality um, information. But, you know, he's, he was a dangerous fucker. What did he get in return? People give information to the police to revenge on other villains, financial reward for themselves, to get rid of the opposition, to clear the field for them. Some, and it, it, this happened in my, life, my lifetime, sometimes the informant is running a cop or running a law enforcement officer. You know, they're not always cops, right? Law enforcement officer. Sometimes it's done full circle and the crook is running the, the handler. So that's, this, that's the reason to do it. Do you think it was easier now to get informants than it is back in the day? Because I say there's more snitches now than, than there's ever been, but has it, has it kind of always been the same? Or is it, because back in the day, people say there was more loyalty, there was more trust, but when I actually interview police, like, they say there was just as fucking bad back then. Or do you, did you see a difference as time was going on? I think there's two big changes, I think, that, that happened from the, the old Star Wars. Organised crime groups, OTGs, your crime families, your, your craze and people like that, right? When they got rid of their opposition, they did it behind closed doors and there was nobody, there was no witnesses in the public domain to, to say what had happened or what they saw. They just disappeared, either in a vat of concrete holding up a bridge or whatever, they just disappeared. Nowadays, they're doing it out in public domain and it's, it's in front of the public. There are witnesses, people are seeing it and, you know, it's then got to be investigated. It's not a misper like it was back in the day. There's a missing person. We haven't seen him for months and months and months. Nobody's talking, you know. But now, they, they just, they, they do it out in the public domain and there's witnesses and, you know, the police are investigating it. Um, so, it's the same thing, but different. You know, it's, it, it's re recruiting informants. There'll always be informants um, for the reasons I stated. What they do for their own, their own reasons. Um, the the rules of evidence um, protected informants um, is a difficult and risky. Um, occupation, part of, the, part of policing, because these people will fucking wipe them out, you know. Did any informants ever get caught out? Um, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, they do. It's, I mean, I've been involved in, in jobs where I've infiltrated a an OCG, an organised crime group. And it's just a gang of blokes, right? This fancy title, organised gang um, crime group. And um, I was with these guys in a boozer and they'd identified somebody as an informant. He's a snitch, he's the grass, he's the one that's fucking giving the cops all the information. And I was privy to this conversation. And they'd... They were going to kidnap him, torture him, get a confession out of him. Either way, he probably would have ended up dead. Now, I'm a police officer hearing that, right? Under the law, there's a, it's called a, um, an Osman warning, right? So I'm now aware that you are in moral danger. I can't fucking ignore that. So I go, I said, they went to phone my call. I said, I need a fucking meeting now. So me or the cover officer tell them what's going to happen because this guy's going to get kidnapped and the police know about it. So the police have got to do something. It's called an ultimate ruling. So um, and it's called that because the police, Mr. Osman, the, the, the thing it's named after, 
was in danger. The police were aware that his life was in danger and they didn't do anything about it. And Mr. Osmond got hurt. Yeah, I've had two Osmonds read out to me. <laughs> I know Osmonds are fine, well. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm thinking of these bastards just trying to get you to break, man, and just because you start worrying where the fuck's that come from. And obviously they say we can't tell you where it came yeah. from, but it gets you fucking thinking. Mm, that's interesting. You've had a couple yeah, of Osmonds. Yeah, I've had two, man. <laughs> but I, I was a fucking young gun back in the day. But I wasn't ever that violent kid, but growing up from a rough area, man, I was always in the mix with. Yeah dodgy bastards and uh, yeah I had two man and like you're thinking that's heavy because it's no fucking mean it's that like, it's the last thing but I actually had a live audience with Paul Ferris the wee man and uh, the coppers come in and gave him a an Osman I think they've changed the name now but I think they gave him an Osman they gave him an Osman at the half time show when they took him off stage and took him upstairs says there's been a threat of danger we've heard there's a danger to your life but he did say that the they shut it down his book signing maybe a few years before and it does I'm surprised the event went ahead because he's a high profile mm. crap. Well, he's, listen he's not been in prison for over 20 years now he's wrote countless books he made a blockbuster film about him but yeah the coppers were there man and they were waiting outside but thankfully there was no trouble it was a great night and listen there was 500 people there people love those sort of yeah, stories man. like even new people love these sort of stories because it's it's just why is true crime such a big seller why is people so engrossed in it well, I've got in, um, involved in the, the crime con, which they uh, staged in London for the first time last year, second time this year. It was in Glasgow as well this year. Went to Glasgow. Uh, and that is, they're like trekkies. You know, it's like Comic Con. They're just people that are really interested in, in crime, true crime. And I'd say the majority of them are females, right? Loads and loads of um, females when you go to the crime con. Um, conference um why are they interested in it see good question that jimmy because like when i sit here talking about you know being in a pub with a load of blokes and i'm, I'm undercover and i'm hearing stuff and this that and the other to me that's that's my job it's what i'm trained to do right but i i don't see the i don't feel i don't feel the excitement or the fascination of, of you know somebody hearing it for the first time um I think where I sense it most is when you walk into court to give your evidence as an undercover officer, because you come in different, you come in through a different door, you treat differently, you're, you're behind screens, and the public can't see you, press can't, the defence and the prosecution and the judge, the jury and the defendant, they can all see you, but the rest of it you're screened off from. So I always feel a bit special then when I walk into that courtroom and, um, of course, you see the person that... Um, six months ago you were best mates with drinking in the, the pub and I often think they're what's going through their minds uh, what, what are they thinking you know betrayal cheating bastard sly fucker sat in my house you fucking met my mum and my kids you fucking uncle I just wish like that must all happen in like a nanosecond five ten seconds going through their heads you know what the f um, if you don't, so if you're undercover and you're working with someone, because Donnie Brasco is a great film. I remember speaking to you on the phone and I said that, like, great film. Like, he went undercover. He grew such a connection with the guy that the guy was broken hearted when he actually found out he was a copper. Like, was there ever that connection with you? You actually befriended someone and then felt guilty where you thought, fuck, man, like, no, that's um, tough. Have you just been so ruthless in your job that like, it's get every bad guy off the streets? I've never emotionally got myself attached to any of the the opposition as i call them how how do you detach from that is that because you're so professional in your job that you you, you always believed you were doing the right thing this is, i'm really good self-disciplined sort of guy and i've got a, an addictive personality so if somebody gives me a set of rules to live by it's probably going back to the military days you know these are the rules this is it this is what you do this is this is how you you behave this is how you act so i've probably Grew up with that through the military, being able to focus on what I'm doing and not get emotionally attached to uh, to people. When I spoke to um, um, Stephen Bentley on that, because he got emotionally attached to his subject, I've never got emotionally attached to any of mine whatsoever. I've never felt like tipping them off or giving them a hug at the end of the day 
or waving to him as you walk in the courtroom or giving my thumbs up and a wink. No, it's um, not at all. I don't, it's just how I am, I just don't do it. How do you, when you start going through, when did you get from the beat to the CID? How long? Um, I was pretty sharp on to CID and I'd, I'd done some attachments with them. I'd, uh, like when a, somebody that's on CID, they go away and do their 10 week detective training course. So when they go away, a up and coming uniform lad gets to work on CID, fills his chair for 10 weeks. So that was the first bit there, I got 10 weeks on there. And then you normally go back to your shift then. But then another lad went off and rather than bring somebody else in, they just moved me across onto another desk. So I got another 10 weeks, so I've had five months then. And I was running his informants. I was, I was bringing jobs in. I was bringing more jobs in than the established DCs were. And they used to call you a TDC in those days, a temporary detective constable. So this temporary detective constable was bringing in his jobs and uh, nicking people. And you probably can it. I'm not shy at talking. And I used to interview him. I, I used to love it. Absolutely loved it. I would have been a good fucking copper then. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A good copper. And uh, <laughs> there, was, there was one guy. He'd, um, he'd got hold of a load of... Um, there'd been a burglary, a building society up in York or somewhere. And a load of these blank checks had gone. But they were building society checks. They weren't bank checks, building society. And they were using them to buy cars with. So they'd see a car advertised in the paper. And... They'd say, right, well, I'm travelling up from such and such. It's a lot of bullshit. Um, and I'll bring the cheque with me. And if I like it, I'll give you your asking price. So they would go up and it was a building society cheque, not like a real cheque. So they'd hand the cheque over, they'd drive away in the car. And then they'd go bank the cheque. It's a stolen cheque, it's bounced. It's, you're not getting your money back. So they lost the car. And this guy was doing this repeatedly all over the place. So we got him nicked and I'm interviewing him. And he... Normal side of the interview, press the buttons, beep, you know, you've heard it. <laughs> Horrible sound. <laughs> and uh, so, right, for the benefit of the tape, you know, you know time, date, place, well, yeah, benefit of the tape, just say your name. And you just sit there like that. I said, can you say your name? And you just wouldn't speak, right? So you go through some questions and um, n nothing. Switch the tapes off. When we switched the tapes off, we got on really well together. We laughed and joked and cracked a few jokes and blah, blah, blah. So I don't know, second, third interview, I don't know, third, fourth interview. Back in there, he's got his brief with him. It's the same routine, doesn't say anything. So, right, fuck it, forget the job, forget the checks, forget the cars. Tell me one of them jokes you keep telling me when the tapes have gone off. And he smiles across the table at me. And he's briefed there and he goes, be very interested to hear the judge's comments when he hears you trying to encourage my client to tell jokes. I said, do you really think this tape is ever going to get in front of the judge? <laughs> do you really? And he wouldn't say a word. He wouldn't say a word. But, um, you know, I liked the challenge from the brief. Though. And then putting the brief back down in his little box. Yeah, I've had a few of that. When was our first undercover job? Right, so... Um, and why did you choose to go undercover? Because so, obviously CID, there's a few different jobs, aren't there, you can choose? Yeah. Um, was that a fascination for yourself, to be challenge. something different? It was a challenge. It was a, a, a challenge for me. Um, I'd gone to CID, worked my way through there, and um, then I applied to go on the regional crime squad. Because that's back in the days where your undercover officers came from. That's where you went to be an undercover officer, or where you was, you know, that was a breeding ground from. Because you worked on a much higher level of criminal investigation. You were taking on the top echelons of criminals. And it used to be a regional thing, and then it went national. Um, because the, the bizarre thing was, if, when it was regional, so there was even smaller regions, but then it went southeast, northeast, south, southwest, all these different areas. Because if you like had an, uh, a gang of armed robbers coming from, say, Kings Lynn in Norfolk, to go and rob somebody, or a bank, or build a society in Cornwall, and they were under surveillance and it'd been our surveillance that went with them. Every time that surveillance crossed into a different force area. So there's 42 police forces in the United Kingdom, you know that? Probably not all of them, do you? <laughs> then half of them? <laughs> nah, was it? It was just all Glasgow. So if you cross six police forces, you have to get permission from six chief constables to carry firearms through his area. Can you imagine how fucking difficult and mad that was? So they changed it to a national thing so that the 
um, Crime Squad had its own chief constable and he could authorise um, carrying firearms and hard stops and shit like that. Uh, so um, I get onto the regional crime squad and we get given a, a crime syndicate to dismantle and we were working with um, customs, we were working with box, MI5, um, spies and um, us, the, the police, all working together to dismantle these groups. And when you're working at that level, you start seeing this tool of undercover being used. And um, I just admired them. I admired what these people were doing, men and women, men and women. I say that as if, you know, that's a surprise women, but men and women were doing this. And I worked with some fantastic women in this job, in that job. Um, yeah, so I applied. I don't know, someone comes out somewhere, it must be in publication something comes out to um if you're interested in working on the cover or doing uh, going forward as an undercover officer and so i got it and i fucking went to my boss with it and said down because he had to endorse it he had to you know to support my um, application i said i want to do this boss and um, he wasn't from my when you're on the crime squad you're from all different forces he wasn't from my force he said no he said you're too nice to blow for that I said, no, I want to do it. I want, I, want the, I want the challenge of doing it. I want to be able to, you know, test myself. And a short conversation, but he endorsed it and um, put me forward. And this goes into what the selection process was like, if you want to hear that. It's, uh, so that then goes forward and he gets paper sifted. So whatever you've written on there. So I had quite, I probably had quite an interesting application because I've been in the military. I could drive lorries, HGVs and you see that in um, Undercover Legends. Um, firearms, I knew inside out, backwards, forwards, the wrong way around, I knew loads about that sort of stuff. I could speak um, doable sort of French and German um, that I picked up. Um, I'd had this streetwise upbringing as a kid in there as well, and my success as a cop. So I had a good application. So I got through the first papers, I've got somebody to look at that. And if they ain't interested within the first sort of four or five lines, is in the bin. So and this is all over the country. This is happening. All these people putting these applications in all over the country. So I put mine in and I get through and then um, I get sent the application form. And the best way I can describe it back in those days was it's like an Argus catalogue, but nothing in it. You had to fill it up. You had to, they ask you questions about everything. And you, you know, you sell yourself through this application. No, book smart. So I've got that street smart, but now I'm book smart. I know how to sort of, you know, put my words together, my sentences and full stops, commas and dotting eyes and crossing T's. So you, you um, fill that in, you submit it. Somebody looks at it, they either throw it over the shoulder or you get through the next round. And the next round was a regional interview uh, where you're sat in front of three top Johnny detectives with lots of undercover experience. So I sat in the senior officers, they sort of run jobs, they've been deployed on jobs, the, the running departments that deal with the undercover stuff. So you get in there, one of them asks you questions about your private life, your home life, um, see what that's all about. And what's your family think you're doing this? Have you shared it with them, blah, blah, blah. The other one will ask you questions on law, law um, around undercover policing. Because I say, you're always a police officer. It doesn't matter if you're undercover or not, you're an undercover police officer. You're a police officer and you've got to abide by all the rules that every other police officer has to abide by. But then you've got other shit to deal with as well. And then the third person asks you scenario type questions. It will just put you into a scenario and give you a set of circumstances until you have to tell them what you would do, how you get out what you would do, whether you could do it, whether you couldn't. You're applying all this law that he's just asked you about and all this anyway. If you get through that, so if you go away and somebody phones you up and say yay or nay, I got a yay. Um, and then, I can't remember which way around it was, I think the next thing is a national board then. So all these people from all over the country. It's that fucking heavy process. Mate, I'm fucking finished yet. <laughs> right? All these people from all over the country then come to Middle England somewhere and you sit in front of three really fucking 
top logs, very, very senior police officers, very senior. You sit in front of them, same thing, private life, your law knowledge, and then your scenario-based questions. And uh, at one point, on the scenario-based questions, I find myself leaning forward in my chair, doing this on my fingers. Well, I've considered this. So he says to me, so you'd do it, would you? I said, yeah. I said, I've considered this. I've thought of that. I've done this. I've done that. We could do this. I found myself like leaning forward into his face, really got into it. And then uh, you get through that, you get a phone call, yeah, and I, and then you go and get psychometrically tested. You, you turn up somewhere and a couple of nut doctors test you um, and they test you with written papers and there'll be something like 200 questions and then we based on, have you ever stolen anything in your life, yes or no? Um, if you could fiddle your tax and get away with it, would you do it? So the questions like that. Um, <laughs> you found the nice empty man, do you know? <laughs> and, um, and then thing, another one's where they say, what do you find more interesting to look at? A well-crafted handgun or a beautiful work of art? You know, and you, I don't know, I'm fucking not really sure. Uh, so you get loads of questions like that and you get interviewed. And then they give these booklets out like little test books. And on the front, it's an example question, right? So that you understand the process, uh, the, the next, the following questions that you've got to work, work out the process of working them out. So they said, right, we're going to do the, the sample on the front. So everybody, do it. so you're going around a class, you know, the group of people, you're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Guess to me, you go, you got it wrong. I said, have I? He said, yeah, it's wrong. <laughs> so you have to show me what to do. So I opened the book up. The first question, right? I'm going to be an undercover cop, right? First question is, three housing estates, all with different value, different type houses, sizes, garages, drives, gardens, no gardens, all this, that, and the other. And then a list of people, what their requirements are and what the budget is. And you have to identify which houses they can buy on which estates. So I've been getting all the way through that, through that, and that. Turn over the next page, it's train timetables, stations A to G, um, different types of tickets, day returns, family returns, rail cards, all this sort of stuff. And then a list of people, different requirements. What's their best, cheapest way of traveling? So I just read that and says, right, put your pens down. I says, my time's up. You know, I've only done one question. I didn't even know how many questions were in the book at the time. I learned later there was five. So you go through this psychometric testing and... Uh, then you have an interview with them, that's, you know, how you deal with stress, how you deal with this, that and the other. And if you get through that, you get to go on the course. And back in those days, it was a two-week course. It started on a Sunday to the Friday. You had the Saturday off. Back on the Sunday to the following Friday. It was run on sleep starvation and pressure. You didn't have time to wipe your ass. And there was, you were doing scenarios. You had the speakers come in. Money Brasco came in. Um, speakers coming in. You were getting lessons, and then you would have to go and uh, regurgitate that in a scenario. You would get another established undercover officers coming in, acting as studies, acting as the bad guys, and then they just uh, fucking mess you up. You know, so you have two weeks of that. What was it like in your past? The, the, so of all those hundreds, there was 12 on the course. So there's 12 of us sat in the classroom, five of us passed. And there's no political correctness in those days. Like one of the instructors had come up to you if you weren't cutting it, just say, it's not for you, mate, you might as well fuck off. Yeah, you know, no no HR, or you go away on the... In what way, though, and what, what, when people were, they just, just didn't you, have that... They couldn't do it, Jim, they just, you know, they... I'm lucky I can talk, right? Some of them would get there... What and... makes a good undercover cop? Yeah, that's another good question. I don't, I don't know, right? I don't know what the magic ingredients are, but I just know there's a lot of stuff you can put in there, and the more you've got, the, the better it'll be. Like I had a, a massive skill set that I could bring to the to the game. So I could talk about haulage, right? I, I mean, I, I could drive trucks because I used to drive trucks in the army. And then I went and learned about the civic terminology of, of haulage and drivers. Um, guns, you know, I could talk ammunition, I could talk guns. Um, I could talk drugs, not because I did them, but because I dealt with people that don't. Go on, I say that, you lying <laughs> bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you're me for 30 years, I know what you're like. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just picked up bits and pieces along my journey of life that when it comes to being a UC, 
I could, you know, I could fall back on them. I could use them, yeah. What was your first undercover job? <laughs> Fuck off, it's embarrassing. <laughs> Why is that? Uh, so you wait for the phone call, right? You fucking you get out of you, 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 You're ready to go, right? You're just bursting to go. The phone goes. And they, they always generally started with the same thing. And I say this in the book. You fancy a bit of work? That's the, like the, the stock phrase. You fancy a bit of work? I said, yeah, yeah, what, what? You say, yeah, you don't even know what it is. <laughs> yeah, 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 what? what, what? Right, um, you've got to get here, pick a car up, and then you've got to, uh, an undercover car, so you've got to get yourself to where the undercover car is parked up, leave your car there, get into that car. And then when you go and pick up UC, another UC, and then when you get here, pick up another UC, and then all three you go with a briefing. And they're all in different... You know, the miles part, they're not all in one town, these fucking things. They're all over the place. So I'm up at like three in the morning to drive to pick the car up, to get in that car, to go and pick him up at six and pick him up at seven to get to a briefing at nine or something like that. And um, you get there to the briefing and these guys have been on the pavement. They've already, you know, they're, they're there for the deal. Right? It's a drug job, it's a heroin job going down. Um, um, Fucking not far from here, actually, in London, surprisingly enough, very first job. So I'm driven all over the fucking country, picking people up, getting to, uh, get to London here, get the briefing, and they're getting told what to do and all that. And they said, and uh, you don't, you, you're you going to drive the mower, all right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're getting the mower, get them in, and all the tapes are running, everything else, got me tape on, third time got tape on, oh, fucking, going to get some bad boys in here. So we stop, they said, right, you wait here, we'll go around the corner and... Uh, see the opposition so I sit in the car they go off come back 20 minutes later um, with a parcel with the, with the drugs and they've all been nicked on the pavement and blah 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 and my boy said never even seen a bad man never saw an angry man fucking didn't see a bad guy all day that was my very first job never seen anybody never did anything drove a fucking car that was it how many jobs did you think you'd done in total oh you know, I was asking myself this on the way down here. I don't know. Um, see, some jobs you're the principal on, right? You're the you're the main UC. You're the guy at the top of the tree. You're going to do the to see the job right to the end and get them next. For that guy to get there, other UCs have been involved on the way. So you uh, you might just have a walk on part. You might have a I have a meet with you, but I'm going to introduce you to a bigger boy that going to deal with this and you drop off and he comes in. So you get countless countless jobs like that where you're um, you know, either a walk-on, a supporting item, what have you. Um, principal ones, I don't know. Um, I've done jobs around heroin, ecstasy, guns, lorry hijackings, contract killings. Um, yeah. It's... How long does, obviously though, separate from how long each one will be different but what's normally a target to get enough information to get a conviction different jobs jimmy like if you're if you're on a intelligence gathering infiltration right if you're there just to fucking give intelligence on what's going on because we know there's something going on but there's no intelligence coming out of this place so you can go in there you can be in there for a year two years some of these guys do some back in my days they had guys that were just totally long-term infiltration me i was you know doing a bit of that infiltration and doing heroin jobs and doing lorry jobs um so it's how long's a piece of string really um yeah see if you were undercover for one family say you went to the boozers with with somebody we have did anybody ever see you who knew you off character no um you you're always very careful that i mean you wouldn't put yourself in that situation for a start you know you've got responsibility for your own safety your own well-being so you'd never walk into a boozer that was on your ground um, or you knew that people that knew who you were and they might not be cops they might be some of the kids i grew up with you know they, were, they don't like me anymore you know they might be in that boozer so you're very very careful not to put yourself on offer that way the only time i've ever seen somebody but he knew me i met him on holiday right i met him on holiday in i think it's the states somewhere like that right and then I was going through Manchester Airport in Sudanham on a job, and he's just fucking in front of me in the queue, this guy. Yeah, I thought, fucking don't turn around, don't turn around, don't turn around. And I just made me get out of the fucking queue and let him go. That's the nearest I ever came to being undercover and seeing somebody that knew me as 
no, no. <laughs> Did your life ever come under any threat at any point? Yeah. Where you um, felt as if, oh, shit, man, I'm in trouble here? A couple of times. Um, one way we walked into a plot and he had a gun and guns were, you know, we don't, we don't do guns. And there was a gun there and the, the job was, I think, already partly compromised um, because this guy was an informant for another law enforcement agency. And when you work on the cover, and I still do it today, right? I still do it. Um, you do counter surveillance, anti surveillance. You control the room, you'll sit in a room, you'll sit with your back to a wall, you can see who's coming, who's going, you can see what's happening. Is that why you're doing that now? <laughs> Walking up to some Glasgow guy, you know what I mean? Don't know what the fuck's happening. Is that why you wanted to go to the toilet and that? Is that to scope the house? That's to put my tape on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking right, you'll be listening back to this interview with some gold to you. Nothing uh, will be getting edited. Is, uh, is that why you do all that though, just to, to know your, your your whereabouts and, and stuff like that? Yeah, and you know, if you're... Right, on this occasion, um, I had a covert flat in the Midlands, right? Um, no, it was in Coventry, right? I had a flat in Coventry. And... It really wasn't a flat, it was I like rented a room in a house, right? But I had the most fucking all singing, all dancing fax machine you've ever fucking seen in the world because I was dealing with this this guy, the opposition, by a fact. Um, so I went to the flat one day, see if there's a see if there's a fax there. And one mm -hmm. and um, I was preoccupied and I got back in my car and I set off. And I'd probably been driving for four or five minutes. I thought, fuck, I've not checked my mirrors once. I've not fucking, when I come out of the flat, I didn't look up and down the street, you know, check the pavement, see what cars are there. Um, so I started checking my mirror. Uh, I couldn't see anything. And I drove to, from Coventry, I drove to Birmingham Airport just to see if anything was coming with me and doing sort of figure of eights and loops and circles and round the block and everything. Didn't seem like I had anything with me. But, because I had discipline in my head, because I'd missed something at the beginning of the, the journey. I thought, well, I won't, I won't take the risk. Um, before I went to where I was going to go, which would have compromised me, it wasn't, you know, um, I parked the car up in a residential estate and I got out. And as I was walking out of this like, cul-de-sac, when you do surveillance, like I've done surveillance for years and years and years, when you do it, you know what it looks like, smells like, walks like, talks like, right? You see it, you fucking know it's surveillance. And I come out of this cul-de-sac and there's a bloke just jumped out of a four-door, two-litre car with a newspaper under his arm, just walking on the pavement. And I thought, fucking, that's a foot man, you know? And uh, so I get back in my car and I think, how oh, the fuck they followed me? So then I start, the paranoia kicks in then. Maybe they put a lump on my car, a tracking device on my car, and that's it. So I got in the back in the car and started riding around this cold sack, you know, where the pavements drop for the driveways to wake the to wake the tracker up. So they think that I was on the move and whatever. And uh, I came out, I fucking um, didn't see anybody, left the car where it was, came out, didn't see anybody, and I jumped on the bus. I didn't even know where the fuck bus was going. How does it fuck with your paranoia, knowing that how human beings can work to manipulate other human beings? Mm. And like, how does it then think, how can you then trust anybody in life? You know, it's a bit too deep on the old psyche for me, that what you said there, Jim. My, my paranoia or my, what I did for my own safety. Uh, yeah, okay, there, there must be paranoia in there somewhere because you're thinking, Who, who's fucking looking at me? Um, I don't know, it's... I don't know, I, I don't know. How does paranoia affect you? It's like people say stress. Don't you get stressed? I said, I don't think I do. I don't think I do get stressed. Uh, but some people say, well, you're getting a bit stressy. I'm not getting stressy. I'm just talking through it, working through how we're going to do this. And maybe that's how I deal with paranoia as well. Maybe I think, well, what would I do? If I was in this situation, how would I follow me? And then I'd do the countermeasures as if some, you know, as it were me following myself. I would sort of work out, what would you do here? How would you shake them off? What 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 would you be, what would you look like if I was following you? So yeah, yeah so I probably don't make any sense. Of that. 
Yeah, but I think everybody's different because I've had a few undercover cops on and their heads are fucking gone. I had yeah. Nalon who was he drug undercover and he had to take drugs and that. Like, but again, I've had the uh, but Craig Harrison on Sniper Army. Like, it's it's difficult with the things that humans see. Like, they've seen a lot of bad shit as yeah. well. That like, we're ever in a situation where you've had to take drugs or had to do something to try and fit in. Um, I've been offered drugs. Yeah, of course I have. Um, but I think if you can be. Not everybody does drugs, right? Not every gangster does drugs. Some of them have got a real strong opinion about drugs. They won't let their kids take drugs, right? So if you... Um, I mean, I've been offered... The first thing I ever got offered was cannabis, right? And, yeah, I'm ready. I've got my answer ready. And that's half the job of being a UC is just, you know, knowing what they're going to do before before they do it. You know, I've been back on the estate, knowing what they're going to do. So... Um, yeah, I got offered cannabis. I said, well, mate, I can't. I said, uh, I'm like, I'll smut it. But when I was a kid, a teenager, when you try stuff, I took some and it fucking nearly killed me. I said, I had to go to the hospital on a breathing machine because it had that fucking effect on me. So thanks very much for that. Charlie, you you know, I've um, bought Charlie off um, cocaine. You know what it is. <laughs> I used to smack, I used to start yeah. it for years. Yeah, Colombian marching powder. Yeah. You know, and uh, the runner for the dealers come with a with a bag and said, oh, can I have a line out of it? I fucking hell yourself, I'll have a line. Yeah. Uh, but I, I would never do it with them. I'd never do drugs. Never do it. How hard was it to, to the bigger families, how hard was it to get an in, but to get information? Were they ahead of it or did you think it was easier as an intelligence crew? Because you're talking about tracking devices have been about for fucking oh. 50s, 60s. They've been about for... for exactly. You see in the mafia used to use the... The telephones nowadays, it's obviously probably easier to catch criminals now because they're all technology, but how was it then to right. gather intelligence? Was people on it then, the big families, to say, nah, he's not in, get him to fuck? I'm going to do a spoiler for you now, right? Yep. In that book there, Undercover Legends, mm -hmm. it makes mention of a job called Operation Candle, and it explains in there how you do this, or how how I did it, how we did it, because of the team of us. And... The words I use is, you make yourself attractive to these people, not in a sexual way, in a in a way that you might have something that might be off use to them, but you don't want to make yourself a pushover. You don't want to make yourself a soft touch where you're going to get used and abused or find yourself being offered to get involved in criminality and you show out by backing out, right? So you make yourself attractive to these people in different ways. So it might be what your commodity is. You might have transport right lorry jobs obviously you know if, uh, i used to tell people i had a fucking haulage company and if they wanted um trucks moving from spain or from um the netherlands from holland you know i can do that for you because i've got a fucking haulage company guess what i do i do european knowledge so you make yourself attractive to them so that's how you get that's one way of getting into them um and i'm not saying anything that's not out there already because these people have been locked up on the strength of this already um you you look at ways of befriending them, but perhaps not going straight at them. Perhaps going at your mate over here, and then your mate introduces you to him. To introduces you to him, but it's come from him. He went to school with him, trust him with his life, right? Um, and I've formed a relationship with him. Um, maybe I bought stuff up. You can you can get involved in crime, as you see. You can get involved in. You can't fucking kill people, right? They can't do that. But you can get authority to be a bit player. As long as you're not driving it. As long as you're... It's a cold agent provocateur. If you come across that one. Okay. So as long, as long as you're not acting as an agent provocateur. If there's a conspiracy already in being, you can join that. And it's all... Not for your own back. Senior management make the decisions and look at everything and they put you in there. So you so you're getting like that. Um, so see if you're getting a gather intelligence, somebody's got a bit of gear on them, see you know somebody's got a parcel or somebody's got a gun. But you're trying to gather more information, would you just let them slide with that? Right. Okay, so if he's the guy who's a subject to the operation, he's the guy you want to lock up. If that's a decent sized parcel and he's gonna get a decent bit of porridge, right? You, you, you'd you take it, you know, and if he puts a gun in as well, that's even better, you know, if you can get the gun off them as well, because that puts another five years on their, on their time um, having guns on it. So, but if it's, if it's small level stuff and no one's getting hurt, 
and it would happen anyway without your involvement or without your intervention. You know, stuff does. Um, we allow it to happen, right? We'll allow so But if they're like going to hurt people, going to torture people, you can't let that happen. Awesome. <laughs> Have you ever wore the you have to wear disguises and stuff? Moustaches, beers, <laughs> dyed hair, and all that. No. Big raincoat on, none no, of that shit. No. It's the, one, of the, one of the things I used to teach about um, when you you see is you'll never, ever, ever change your character, your persona, your, your mannerisms, right? Why you, is that? Because you can't do it. You can't, you, can't, you can't do it. How I'm sat here talking to you today is how I am talking with my mates in the pub. I'm not doing it, anything different because we're doing this. Is that because you can come out a character and maybe forget then it's a telltale sign that something's not right? Well, you've always got to keep the lie as close to the truth as possible. That's the easiest way of remembering shit is to keep that lie as close to the truth. Um, so um, I used to talk about my family, right? But I'd give them fucking different names. I've been divorced, or I could use that, you know, and say, well, yeah, I was, and blah, 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 I've got a girlfriend. There's one bloke tried to get me off with his mum. We'd, we'd, uh, it's in there, it's in um, Legends. He's a um, fucking good fraudster, very, very good fraudster, and he just got out of prison for massive fraud, probably VAT or something, because that's the only people that put you in prison for, for fraud nowadays. And um, he got out and got himself mixed up with a couple of muppets and got himself nicked again. And uh, he suggested to the interviewing team, you know, could we do a deal on this? The inference was he's looking for a deal. And the detective interviewing him thought, fucking hell, I think I've just been offered a bribe. He spoke to somebody who spoke. Anyway, I got a phone call at home on a Sunday. You fancy a bit of work? I said, yeah, what is it? And one of my mates, he'd, he'd become a network of UCs on down the country. And, you know, and in Europe, I used to pull UCs in from Germany, Poland, um, Holland, they used to get from all over because you get them pulled over and work on their ground as well, which was nice. So, uh, this guy, um, cut long story short, so we, we end up meeting and he won't say a word, he sat there like that. And um, we're in a hotel coffee lounge, the surveillance team, evidence in the meet all around us. And uh, I said, I wonder if you fucking want that. And I asked him a few more questions. You've got to be careful because. You can't ask questions that go directly to the heart of the investigation because that's again the cold sea of pace. So you've got to you ask oblique questions. You can't ask, you know, what do you want me to do with your passport or whatever. So I said, what do you want? You want to speak to me? I said, mate, it doesn't fucking work like this. You know, if this is going to work, you've got to say something, don't you? So he said, we'll go for a walk around the car park. So we go for a walk around the car park. He says a lot, but he doesn't say enough. But it's all getting tamed. And he says, um, I want to meet you in a sauna. I said, you what? Do you want to meet you in a sauna? We were fucking both naked. So you think, fuck, you know, you don't want to do that, do you? Straight away you think, I don't want to do that. But you've got to think of a reason why you don't want to do it. At the same time, I was thinking, I don't want to do it. So I said, no, man. Because there's been a lot of um, disclosure programmes on the TV, you know, Panorama, and going into police canteens and putting bugs in there and catching cops, the same things they shouldn't say. I said, mate, I can imagine it now. Me and you, Naked in the sauna, we walk out and you're fucking trying to be the reporter of the year of my fucking career, my expense. I said, hey, I fucking know me. So I called back and said, look, he wants to go back to the team. So he wants to fucking meet in the sauna. Well, you can't fucking record in the sauna, can you? So, uh, but he won't speak to me unless we're in the sauna. So I said, right, okay, I'll phone him up and meet him. I'll meet him in the sauna, but I can't fucking record the conversation, the evidence. And, uh, Got a recording device on my body, bit somewhere. And we get into the locker room, right? And he's in one cubicle facing me in another cubicle, and he makes me strip down naked in front of him, right? Now he's hung like with the baby's arm, right? I can't tell you. It's fucking... You must be a relation to me then. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, I'm a, I'm on a job. I'm nervous, right? <laughs> I'm on a job. I'm nervous. So my manhood isn't where it should be compared to fucking where it was. So you know, we do the do the deed, everything else, blah blah blah. And then we we'll we go for a coffee afterwards. And um, he says, "He he uh, he married on, keep the you know the the lie it's close to the truth." He said, "No, I'm divorced." I said, "Well, I've got a girlfriend." He said, "Oh, because um, my mum's about your age, cheeky bastard." And um, I think you make a nice couple, you know. 
that's after seeing me touch her, right? It's probably for he ain't gonna hurt me yeah. mum with that. Is he? <laughs> yeah, so there's funny, there's funny stuff as well like that. What's the biggest operation you worked on? Uh, I can't talk about some, right? Yeah, yeah. Because um, I wasn't disclosed. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that would uh, like to square the square the books, balance the books. Um, so a lot of them I, I can't talk about, and I wouldn't. That that's for my own safety. personal safety and reasons. Um, the I worked on a heroin job that was being organised by serving police officers. They were the the um, trying to get kudos for themselves by pulling a parcel of heroin onto the pavement through an informant who was an heroin dealer and getting the buyers, us, but they didn't know we were undercover cops, the Ben cops didn't know it, on the pavement so that him and his squad would look the dog's bollocks. We've got the drugs, we've got the money, and we've got the buyers. And the fucking supplier got away, or the top supplier, some mubby on the pavement taking the fall for them. Um, that was quite a big job because of the consequences of um, being corrupt police officers and uh, what happens with them. And I mean, I've worked with some guys that have gone to prison who have, um, you know, worked alongside non-cover officers, just uh, police officers. Um, and... Do you feel as if it's just a revolving door? So you get drug dealers, put families in prison, mm -hmm. somebody else just steps up and takes, and takes over? Yeah, there, there is that to it, but... Uh, Yeah, there'll always be somebody to fill their shoes. And that's like when we talked about informants, to get rid of the opposition because they want their, their ground as well. Uh, but I don't think you can, unless somebody can come up with a better system, right? And, uh, you know, I know some people's views on, let's talk about, let not get into it, but legalising drugs and what you. Uh, you know, I just see so many fucking issues of doing that. And I know, because I've, I've heard your, you, you talk on it before with other people, about, you know, this is what we should do and this is what will happen. Well, I don't know. I don't think you do know what will happen because, you know, there'll always be bootlegged something or other out there. And, yeah, so... Do you think that's what it's all about, bro? The, the good and the bad, like the... There's always a chase, there's always something new that crooks can jump on to try and... And then there's always a new law to prevent it because it keeps everybody in a job as well. well you know how I sometimes explain that? So you've got a, a brand new building, right? So it's built in year one, this building, right? And as the years pass, the building starts needing repairs on it and bits of scaffolding putting up against it and repairs. And then after a while, you can't see the original building because it's hidden behind all the scaffolding and the windows have changed everything. But it's it's still in there. The, the fundamental building is still there. It's just that some barrister... No, that's the problem. Somebody somewhere will find a loophole and exploit it until we shut that loophole. But like you say, as soon as you shut that one, they'll find another loophole. They'll find another way of getting around the system. Gangsters, some of the gangsters I've been up against would make excellent businessmen. They are businessmen. It's just that their commodity is illegal or what they're doing is against the law. But they are good businessmen. The ones that run it like, not these that do the violence and the fear and the intimidation to get what they want done. They're nothing but thugs, right? Yeah. But there are good, smart, switched on individuals out there making money out of crime. Did you ever respect any of the men you put away? Um, once, one sent me a Christmas card once. <laughs> to the, yeah, yeah he's uh, a robber. He sent me a Christmas card. Cheeky yeah. bastard. No, he was, he was genuine. <laughs> no, when, when I nicked him, he was as good as gold. You know, he's one of them old time likes. Um, ain't going to fuck you about. You've got me on this. You're not. You're not going to get anything else out of me. And yeah, this is this is what you got me for. Blah blah blah. Um, respect that informant I spoke about about the, the car and the Colombian wife. Um, he he was a, a nice bloke. He's the sort of bloke I could have got on with, you know, outside the job. Um, I could. I know. When I was a kid, I grew up with people who were criminals. Their fathers were criminals. Yeah. Um, so I've you know I've been in that arena where. Um, you know, my mates, you, you don't use the word respect when you're a kid, you know, you don't respect your mates. The mates, aren't they? And um, the dads and their uncles. 
and the mums, <laughs> the ranties, you know, they're all like, they're yeah, all like, the housing estates, it's just, there's not enough money, people just try to do what it is to get by, like, you'll cut every corner, it's not necessarily they're bad people, it's just their ways, their means of surviving. Well, when I was, um, when I joined the army, I was starting to do the, I did the coding, you know, the cryptos on that. You have to go, you have to go through a process called positive vetting then, and it's vetting at a very high level because you're dealing with top secret material and they don't want every Tom, Dick and Harry fucking, you know, sharing the, the nation's secrets. So you go through the thing called positive vetting and they take you from the womb right up to where you are there and they contact all these people you've met on the way. Of course, my younger years, my teenage years, we spent on this council stack where the police were there all the time and my mates were in trouble with the police and we were all in trouble with the police at some stage. And it took ages and ages for them to get my vetting done because there was another guy going through at the same time. He'd done it, he was away on his course and I'm still fucking waiting. And um, it eventually comes through and they said, oh, we had a nightmare um, tracing some of your friends. Because they'd go to the front door of number 21, knock on it, they're all suited and booted, aren't they, with briefcases in their hands. My mates would be looking out the windows, thinking it's the old bill, out the back garden, over the fence, across the school fields, and away. And then mum would open the door and the blow would be there. So that was uh, Mr. Billy Boggs here. She said, oh, he hasn't lived here for ages. He went out a couple of weeks ago, hasn't come back, don't know where he is, does it all the time. You know, so I can his mum covering for him. Yeah. And two or three visits like this, and they had to say, look, we're from the Ministry of Defence. We just need to speak to Billy about Don and, you know, when he, when they used to play, it's, it's kids to get through and all this, that yeah. and the other. He's not in trouble. So it took him ages to trace all my mates because they're always on the toes. In your book's legends, you're, you're working with a girl, um, yeah. it's Mr and Mrs Smith kind of book, like the film with Brad Pitt, stuff like that. How did you find that easier working with someone, female? Um, I didn't know. It's any difference. I work with some really good females. I work with some really good males. I work with some really not so good males. Um, and not so good females. So, there's, you know, there's no difference. In that world, in that UC world, there's, um, when you're on the plot, when you're on the pavement, there's no political correctness, right? There's none of this, uh, the woke and, and society and, you know, upsetting with somebody's feelings. Because, you know, the criminals, the ones I met, you know, they're not, they're not interested in um, health and safety and upsetting somebody by comments and using the... Um, language that you know we wouldn't we don't use we don't use in every everyday conversation uh, but yeah um, the Mrs Smith in that book um, you know she's a very I've got to watch what I say here because <laughs> she might listen to this um, yeah, she's a very strong character very very strong individual had um, a different upbringing to what I had um very very different and um she was a single parent as well and uh which is enough on its own and then she's doing this work on top um yeah a strong girl yeah what was it like do you get a good feeling when you get a a conviction is it like, like if you play football you score a goal or is it just a case of the novelty always wears off and it's just you're in that loop or do you feel as if you've been caught doing a good job? Like, how does it go when you're 10, 20 yeah, years deep? Some jobs, when you get some jobs off, there is a rush, you think. Yeah, that was good. That was, that was a good bit of work, that. And you're confident that when you go into court, because when you, when you go to court, me personally, always nervous. You're always nervous because you don't know what you're going to get asked. You don't know whether you might have stepped over the line or said the wrong thing at some point. Because it's like hours and hours and hours of tape recorded conversation and the defence get it all and they can nit the, nitpick their way through those conversations to any infringements of the laws of evidence, the rules of evidence. Um, so when you've had the job off on the pavement, that's good. And then you go to court, you give your evidence and you disappear. You don't hear the, the result until sometimes. But generally there's a a social gathering at a pub somewhere um, on the day of sentencing and you'll slide into that that group of you know, you'll have a dream of the barristers with the operational team um with the the other ucs and um, yeah that's that's a that's a nice time how was it retiring 
No, no problem at all. I should have, I should have retired. I retired twice from um, the cops. So like I said, when I, I came in, I only had 20 years to do. And when my 20 years was coming up, so, uh, so I joined the 30, I would have been 50. And um, people said, and I was really in the middle of a fucking good job, really in the middle of a good job. And I was running it. So from that first job, driving a car and not seeing any fucker, <laughs> and getting up at three in the morning and what have you. At the end, no, I wasn't only deploying as a UC, I was covering jobs, I was acting as a cover officer. And that's the conduit between the UC and his operational team. He's a firewall, he's a protector. He, he looks after your interests and he's generally another UC. So I was doing cover, I was doing deployment, and then I was putting jobs together. I was doing tactical advisors for um, like Operation Candle. That was, um, I got given a problem. Is any way of solving this? And we did a infiltration. And that's what Candle's all about. And that's where Sam features. <laughs> and as a result of that, we got, you know, emotionally involved, shall we say. How do you, when you retire, then try and get back into a normal life? Like, does life become boring because there's not much activity or can you start or can you enjoy it no my i'm not a, a sit down sort of person I, I've, I've, I've not i've got to keep doing things i just do things i just find things to do um so i retired for the first second third time in about 10 years ago and i was just going to take a year off i was going to detoxify myself for a year not do anything go and play golf, go and places I want to go and visit. Um, just, you know, just do shit for a year, just to get it out of my system. And so I retired on the first of the month and I went to a business startup exhibition in the O2 in London. And I came back when, when I was working, um, Anyway, no, I won't go into that because someone will say, fucking, I know who he is now. So I went to this business startup exhibition and come back and I said to, I said to Sam, I've just had a light bulb moment. And I spent three months building a business, building the foundations for business. So, you know, was, did I sit at home and think, what do I do now? I got a web designer, made a web page. I bought and went on training courses and bought the equipment, the best equipment and the best products. And the best thing I did was I bought three BT phone numbers and had them all diverted to my mobile phone. And there were three numbers in three different towns along a stretch of motorway. And I looked like a fuck off big business. I looked like a franchise. And it was me, one mobile phone and a van. <laughs> and it went absolutely cosmic. It went ballistic and in year to, just coming up to the third year anniversary. I was in Palm Springs on my holidays because I let me travel. But the guy, I then had people working for me. I had people on zero hour contracts. I was buying bookkeeping, recruiting, HR. Um, and I was running it all from my study at home. Then the guy I had as my sort of manager used to have a um, carpet fitting company. And um, we'd go in and I'd letting agents, schools, councils, contracts with everybody. And uh, we started laying carpets and we started doing the maintenance. As long as there was no gas, water and electric flowing through it, we'd do all that malarkey. Well, after coming up for three years, it was just, I realised I'd got a business and I wanted a hobby, but I've got a fucking business. How was it writing your book, Legends? Undercover Legends? Yeah, really enjoyed but a lot of help from um, that lad, um, Bentley. But yeah, it was good because I think there's about seven different jobs in there. Mm -hmm. Where can people buy your book? Yeah, um, get on Amazon mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, the biggest bookshop in the world now, Amazon, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> Unfortunately. Massive, yeah. yeah. So yeah, if you're, uh, if you're interested in it, get onto Amazon, Undercover Legends, mm -hmm. David Lacarouge. How would, uh, would you like to finish up on anything, brother? Well, mate, no, I've just, I don't know. How long have we been nattering? Like I know, I'm 40 minutes. Is it really? Fucking hell. You can talk, big man. You can tell you were a copper.
But for coming on today and st- telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that people like these kind of stories. I know we couldn't get it in depth. You don't want to give too much of your identity away, which is understandable. But for anybody that's maybe want to join the army or the coppers, what advice would you have for them? Oh, right. Do you know- don't go in the police at 18, right? It's all different now because they have to have a degree, right? So you can leave college, what, 18, then join the police, do three years getting your degree, but you're still on the streets working. But the, like the first jobs I got sent to as a cop, and most people get sent to, are domestic violence. Mr. and Mrs. and knocking lumps out of each other. I grew up in a house full of domestic violence. To me, walking into that didn't phase me. And you know what I said about using discretion? Nine times out of 10, the cops would go in there, grab the bloke, take him to the cells, put him in the cells overnight. And, uh, you know, just a waste of money, a waste of time, a waste of effort and everything else. I used to go in there, I'd take the bloke out, I'd take him to his brother's house, I'd take him to his mate's house. You know, and again, you're just winning the respect of these people by doing that. And quite rightly so too. You know, why? I mean, I've had, I have arguments. I've had arguments with all my wives and my current partner. You know, you know, why? Yeah, but so the police, I wouldn't do the police until you've got some life skills, until you've been out there, do a different job, whether you be working in, you know, a coffee shop or a warehouse or something, but do something and then you've got something in that toolbox when you come to the old bill, when you join the old bill. Don, is there any social media that people can contact you on? Or what's the website? Have you got a website? No, I don't, Nothing obviously. Nothing I thought, no. just total. No. Well, my co-author on that, on Undercover Legends, um, Bentley, he's um, he's got all that, and he acts as a bit of a firewall for me, to be honest. So if anybody wants to know anything, get hold of him, and um, he'll get hold oh, of me. For coming on today, thank you for giving me the time. I wish you all the best for the future, and I look forward to maybe seeing you again. Cheers, buddy. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.